You know, there are certain expectations I have when it comes to life. At this time of the year, it's going to go back to school and school supply shopping. Anyone else doing school supply shopping? And and I'm always amazed how much Kleenex is needed in those classrooms. What is going on, right? Um, At this time of the year, I usually expect for the grass to grow brown. um, And for me to wonder, will I even have any grass left because it's been so dry? Anyone else have brown grass? Sometimes in the middle of summer, right? Uh, There are expectations I have when it comes to the Cubs especially when they send in their bullpen. And right now, that's not good expectations if you're a Cubs fan. Uh, If you're an investor, there are certain expectations you can have when it comes to the market. I don't know if you were watching this past week, but the Dow had its sixth largest drop in history on one day. And uh, and you can come to expect market fluctuation. Uh, It's just the way it is. Life is filled with expectations, Right? When I go to Starbucks, there are certain things I expect about the ambiance and about what I'm taking in. I have a certain set of expectations for Walmart and Aldi and all sorts of things. I bring this up, and you're still with me, because as we've gathered in this place, I wonder what could we expect when it comes to God? Can I answer that? I don't know what your experience is with God, but I believe that you can expect He will surpass your expectations, that he will blow your socks off, that if you get the message for what it is, you'll just be like, oh my goodness, that's incredible. In fact, some have said that when when you walk with God, it's kind of like finding a treasure in the field, and, and you'd be willing to sell everything else and just have the treasure. That's how far superior God is. In fact, the Christ follower said, you know what, everything else is garbage in the world next to knowing Jesus Christ, the Savior. That's how good he is. Are you so convinced? For he has loved us when we were unlovable. When we were sinners, Christ died for us. He is the one who has had victory for any and all who cling to his name. He's just amazing. He is beautiful. In fact, one of the great songs that I'm listening to right now uh, says this, that you're bigger than I thought you were. I heard that you were big, but you're bigger than I once thought you were. A great song. Now, along with God, there are certain expectations you can have about living the Christian life. You can read the Bible and find so many different expectations. For example, uh, this past week I was talking about one of those expectations when it comes to living generously. Oh, look at this passage with me. It says, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. So what can you expect? When it comes to money, Christians believe it's all from God. And I can expect, just as a farmer going out with a handful of seed might not gather a whole bunch of seed, where a farmer who goes out with thousands and thousands of bags of seed will will then gain more seed. So this is us with money. If I give generously, God is saying, you know what? You can't outgive the giver. In fact, uh, maybe there are some who even experienced this. You've been generous and you've seen his generosity. It's incredible, this principle. And also likewise, the opposite. So that's just one explanation. That's one expectation. That one was for free. But we're talking about something else during this series called The Good Work. Well, we're talking about what could we expect as we set out to do the things of God, that good work. And have a visual of what it's like. Now, I've never played paintball, but I get the concept. Uh, this is someone playing capture the flag. Anyone ever play capture the flag? Raise a hands, capture the flag. So, so you get it, right? You're, you're going to go get that thing, but you know there is opposition. They, they want to get you in prison. They want to shoot you, especially where you don't have padding if you're playing paintball. Those vicious friends. Anyway, um, th- there's opposition for you to get that flag and bring it back. And I would tell you, this is the Christian experience. This is the good work of God. And every time we go about it, there will be someone with opposition trying to shoot us down, trying to get in the way, trying to stall that path. I guarantee it. In fact, Pastor Craig Rochelle from where we get this series of good work, he put it this way. Uh, It's our first takeaway. That opposition goes up when the good work is about to go down. And and maybe this relates uh, to you. Uh, Maybe it was you coming to church. And, and you hadn't been in church in a while, but on the day you decide to go to church, that's the day that the car breaks down. Or that's the day, and you're never called into work, but the boss wants you there on Sunday. 
That's the opposition I'm talking about. Or maybe it's this. You're, you're serving for the first time at church. Get involved in the children's ministry. That's awesome, right? Telling young ones about Jesus, their Savior. But this has never happened before. As you are on the watch, there is a kid who takes a dive, gets this goose egg as, as large as a softball, and now you never want to serve again because of what you just saw, right? It happens. Or maybe you, you thought, I'm going to be generous, I'm going to trust God with my money, and then the bill comes. I didn't even see where this one came from. Can't do it, we'll wait some other time. See, whenever you set out to do the good work, the opposition will come up. And, and, and as a pastor, you think I know a thing or two about this? Can I, can, I, can I give you a lens? I don't know how real to be. Sunday mornings, friends. My family can be completely healthy, like pristinely healthy the rest of the week. But Sunday morning, cyclically, there will be disease. And it will seem life-threatening. I mean, we go from DEFCON 5 to 1 in no time because it's Sunday morning. I have come to this place, and I have seen on our doors the thing that hinges it on top, whatever that's called, like fall off. And I'm like, how does that even happen? Saturday night was someone unscrewing it just so I could get here and see that? That's almost impossible. I have been in worship services where these lights turned into like a disco thing, and some of you were there. And I couldn't even plan the lights to do that, but it was like a, a flashing and like a beat and like a what in the world, right? In fact, this one time, this one candlelight service, friends, we, we had a fireball right there as I was trying to share Jesus Christ. Yes, a fireball. We know a little bit about opposition whenever the good work is about to go down. Oh. But Jesus warned us. And that's one of the things I want you to know is that it shouldn't be a surprise. Jesus told us. Uh, he said no student is above the master if they treated me a certain way. If I had this experience, so they will you. You know, he put it this way. He said, remember what I told you. A servant is not greater than the master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. But also, look at the upside. If they obeyed my teaching, if you push through, they could obey as well. The word could win in the end. That's why I'm still here. That's why we're still here, right? But in our time together, we really want to focus on how do we deal and handle with the opposition that we can expect? What's the best way to go about it? And it's interesting because Aristotle actually had a way to avoid opposition. You can take the Aristotelian method. It's this. He said to avoid criticism or opposition, just say nothing, do nothing, and be nothing. Right? Now, how this applies, if you want to do it as a Christian, is I could be a Christian just on the sidelines and never engage. I could just only do what's convenient, never really put any skin in the game. And honestly, if that's the case, you might not get much opposition because really there's not much impact happening. But the moment you set out to do a good work, be prepared. And I do believe that God wants us engaged. All in different ways, I grant you, but he wants us to put some skin in the game. He wants us to get out there and be like Jesus. I was reading from the Bible this past week. This is my personal devotion. This passage came up. It says, whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. And so this means sacrificial service. This means an all-out, all-in, for the sake of God's glory type of effort. And when you're living that way, the world hates it. And the devil is real. And even there's something inside of us that wants it to stop. And this is the opposition we face. So a better way of dealing with opposition? Learning from those who handled it and handled it well. And that's what we're going to get into. So we're in the story of Nehemiah. And Nehemiah, uh, his good work, what he was setting out to do, was rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. And today we see that not everyone's happy about this. In fact, they're going to taunt, and they're going to threat, and we're going to see how he handles. So Nehemiah 1 uh, to 15, we're going to read this whole thing here and then dig into it. So here it says, When Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews in the presence of his associates and the army of Samaria. He said, what are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore the wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life? 
from those heaps of rubble, burned as they are. Tobiah the Ammonite, who was at his side, said, <laughs> what they're building, even a fox climbing up on it, would break down their wall of stones. But Nehemiah said, Hear us, our God, for we're despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them over as plunder in the land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight, for they've thrown insults in the face of the builders. So we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height, which is remarkable. For the people worked with all their heart. But when Samballot, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the people of Ashdod heard the repairs to Jerusalem's walls had gone ahead and that the gaps were being closed, they were very angry. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. But we prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. Meanwhile, the people in Judah said, The strength of the laborers is giving out, and there is so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. The threats had deteriorated some of their strength of heart. Also, our enemies said, Before they know it or see us, we'll be right there among them, and we'll kill them and put an end to their work. Then the Jews who lived near them came and told us ten times over, Wherever you turn, they will attack us. So therefore, my response I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall at the exposed places, posting them by families with their swords, spears, and bows. After I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, this is one of the greatest speeches, the officials and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, who is great and awesome, and fight for your families, your sons, your daughters, your wives, your homes. Now, it seems like Hollywood ripped that one off, right? How many times have you heard something like that in a, in a war scene, right? They got it from Nehemiah. Anyway, when our enemies heard that we were all aware of the plot and that God had frustrated it, we all returned to the wall, each to our own work. This is the word of God. Incredible management, incredible response to opposition. Could you turn to the person next to you and tell them something? Tell them it's worth it. It's worth it. It's worth it. Because that's the devil's biggest lie, by the way. When you're being opposed, he's going to whisper and say, it's not worth it. But I tell you, it's worth it. So opposition, we live in a funny age, don't we? Um, I still remember when the internet was dial-up, and you had all the beeps and the the fuzz, right? But the internet has really changed things. And one of the things that's changed for the worst is how much you can get bad information, whether against your point of view or against you personally, right? Right? And so we've all had this experience, I don't know what it was for you, where you were reading a blog, or maybe reading the comments on Facebook, or maybe reading the comments on Instagram, and there was some rage boiling up inside. You ever been there? Because of what was said. In fact, social media is such a problem today that many are seeing that it can lead to depression and anxiety And celebrities who are very well known are also um, being wise by getting off of it. For example, one of them is Selena Gomez, who said, "I'm, I'm deleting Instagram from my phone regularly. And why? Because this is her experience. She said this, you can't avoid it sometimes, those hurtful remarks. You fixate on the negative ones, and they're not like you're ugly. It's like they want to cut into your soul. And some of you know what she's talking about. In fact, I remember when this happened to a buddy of mine who's a pastor. Um, This pastor, incredible guy, who is beginning a phenomenal new ministry, but it was a new ministry style. Um, And this was a guy that that had taken me to minor league baseball games, had a heart for Jesus and the church and our church body. But he was being lambasted online. There was a blogger out against him. And whenever they searched his name, um, th- this person who was blogging against him labeled him the worst things you can hear as a pastor, like heretic. That's, that's one of the worst things you can call a pastor. Um, destroyer of God's church because of what he's doing. And, and you just had hurtful words, the most loveless interpretation of what he was doing, and anyone who Googled him could find this online. And it just weighed him down. I still remember And so I remember thinking, okay, I'm I'm new in ministry. What if this happens to me? What am I going to do if this blogger comes out against me? And by the way, he did. 
This blogger, this one who, again, you can Google search, uh, has a blog dedicated to uh, styles of ministry he doesn't agree with and just labels heretic and all these bad things, right? But I have no idea what he actually wrote. And do you know why? Because I think by the Spirit of God, he gave me a way of handling opposition. And to this person who I've never met, who I know does not love me, who I know has an agenda that is not my own agenda from God, I don't need to hear what he says. And here is your first way of dealing up with opposition. By not giving it your attention. Can I free you up this morning? You are free not to read every Facebook comment on your post. You're free. In fact, you're free not to post in a polemic argument. That would be helpful. Those arguments that only uh, polarize and do not move a position, you're free not to post there. And you are free when it comes to those who don't know you, who don't love you, who are not trying to accomplish what you're trying to accomplish, given by God, to not let that sink into your soul. You're free. In fact, that's what Nehemiah knew. Because what does Nehemiah do? Nehemiah is not hurrying to send responses to those who are against him. And Nehemiah knew a thing or two about those bad comments. For, for look again at what uh, Sanballat and Tobiah were saying. Um, Sanballat said, what are those feeble Jews doing? Now, I was doing some research, and feeble is a word for um, also describing a flower that's been cut from the stem. So that flower is going to wilt. And so when he says feeble, we have like an English idiom called a, a shrinking violet. Have you ever heard of that? So he's basically saying they're just a bunch of shrinking violets. They got nothing. And Nehemiah could have responded and said, well, you know what, Sanballat, you guys are a bunch of jellyfish. Spineless people, right? Could have done that. Or then Tobiah, and Tobiah's kind of clever. What are they building? Even a fox would climb up and break down their wall of stones. Now, I was doing some research about foxes. Maybe you know a thing or two. They're not so heavy. On average, they weigh about 15 pounds. And so Nehemiah, he, he could have gotten back and given a zinger. Well, if someone goes on the walls of the Ammonites, if a cicada sits on it, it would crash. Now, I don't know how much cicadas weigh, but I'm sure it's less than a fox, right? Or it's like those series of jokes and I won't get into the your mama jokes, but anyway, um, you, you just, you could engage. It's probably better not to, right? And this is what we learn. So, so what does he do? Nehemiah, instead of sending a messenger out, he goes directly to the throne of God. He prays. And he puts the situation in God's hands. And this is our second takeaway. When it comes to opposition, and this was from Pastor Craig Rochelle as well, deal with it not by engaging on a lower level. For if you do that, it might validate all the bad things they're saying anyway. You'll be as low as, as what's going on. But rather, turn to a higher power. Put it again in the hands of God. And when you do this, when you pray, one of the things that might happen is that if there was a true criticism, maybe God will refine you, but he'll also encourage you with the forgiveness of God. That could happen as I go before the Lord. I do that all the time with repentance. But another thing, he might bring a calmness and a spirit about me that will be pleasing rather than polemic as a response. You know who this points to most of all? Jesus, the Savior. Did Jesus know anything about opposition? Did he know anything about criticism? Friends, remember the day he died? On the day Jesus gave his life, there were two next to him. And scripture makes very clear that these thieves were hurling insects all to, at him. All day long, or along with the rest of the crop. In fact, one of the thieves said this. He said, aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. And you think of what kind of burning that would build in, in the heart of Jesus. I am the Messiah. I could come down, I could zap you, I could get everything done, but I wouldn't accomplish salvation. And so he stays and he bears that zinger. In fact, Jesus takes it further. You might know the story that one of the thieves stopped hurling insults and started saying, actually, we're wrong, he's right. In fact, would you remember me when you get into your kingdom? And what does Jesus say? Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? 
After all that, now you want no way. Is that what Jesus says? He's so beautiful. He says, actually, in that instant, fully, freely forgiven, today you'll be with me in paradise. And this is the heart of Jesus, our Savior. It doesn't matter how long you've been opposed to him, how many times you've been questioning him. As often as you come, as quickly as you come, so quickly does he say, don't you know, yeah, you're forgiven. That's my heart. Slow to anger, abounding in love and mercy. Every time you come, so often do I freely restore you and forgive you. And so maybe this is the best way. Maybe the best way of handling opposition is through love and forgiveness. That when it comes to those who might oppose us, we just pause and we pray for them, not just the situation. And not in a condescending way, like, bless your little heart. Not, not in a way that, that you're superior, but in a way that is genuinely just saying, Lord, I want what's best for them. They're not seeing it, Lord. Breakthrough. Breakthrough for their sake. You know, remarkably, this has been happening by other Christians because of opposition. In the news, we've seen the sad stories of what happened in Dayton and El Paso. In the news, we heard different responses to that kind of hate and what's going on. But also, we heard of one family who have chosen to forgive the shooter in El Paso, the Jamrowski family. Now, this is the mom, Misty, who lost her daughter and son-in-law in El Paso. They left behind three children who will now no longer have a mom or a dad. And these were the words of Misty Jamrowski that just kind of blew my mind in this moment. We forgive him. We honestly forgive him. We pray for him and we hope that he finds God because God teaches you to be loving. Can you imagine that moment? And what that would take to say that then? If the power of Christ can compel someone to say that then, can that same power not compel us to handle opposition differently? To be filled with such love and mercy and grace that love could even be the breakthrough? That's, a, I believe, is our calling in Christ Jesus. But there's more to learn. And as I look at the story of Nehemiah, I think one of the most phenomenal things is his way of stewardship, of understanding what he has to do and understanding also what God will have to do. And when it comes to life, I I think sometimes we, we mix this up. We mix up what I am only supposed to do and what God is only supposed to do. Let me give you an example. Uh, when, it, when it comes to my life, I can think that like my cleaning days, my hobbies, maybe even my work, that's just what I got to do. So, so when I'm in those arenas, hobby, cleaning, work, like God, go do your thing. I'm going to do my thing. We're going to do our thing separately, God. I got this, right? Where there are other areas of life where we just lean heavy on God. God, when it comes to my relationships, my financial future, when when it comes to all those big weighty issues of the car I drive and the house I live in, God, it's all up to you. Figure it out. Sort it out. Now, to give you a better illustration of how this might work, let's take Nehemiah and what he wants to accomplish. Either I got this or God, you got this. Now, Nehemiah is a very spiritual man who's trying to rebuild the wall, and I got my wall here. What Nehemiah could have done in his spirit is he could have said, God... Make a wall. God, I I really believe this is your plan. It's for your people. Make a wall. God, I'm going to pray again. God, could you just bring the wall together? Make a wall. Is the wall going to make itself? Would it be cool, by the way, if if he did do that right now? Like he just like started? Because he could. Because he could. Right? But what does he actually have to do? It's not just about prayer. It's, it's about him going to work. So he said, God, uh, today I'm getting to work today. I'm going to build the wall, but I need your blessing. And so, so he knows that he's not just going to look at the bricks. He's going to get people around, and, and he's going to construct them. And, and the purple is going to be a great base just because that's how it works. And, and I, I'm going to say, uh, what next? And, and maybe the, the red. Yeah, the red. Okay. Bless it, Lord. Okay. And, and so he's building the wall, and, and, and there we go. And, and all right. And, and, and then when the wall is completed, then I could say, see, see, God, I built it, but Lord, keep it there, right? 
And it's that combination of not only praying, but actually doing, that accomplishes the building of a wall. No, I know this is a silly example, but it's a great stewardship principle. For the stewardship principle I'm trying to get across is this, that we need to praise if it all depends on God. And never give up on praying, because he is the power for any success or blessing. But then we need to get to work. And work as if it all depends on us. You see, the, the passage that really struck me in, in, in this whole section was verse 9. And, and what it says is, we prayed to God and. Can you just say that with me? Uh, the, the yellow part. Prayed to God and. And I wonder if there's an area of your life where you need to pray to God, but you need an and. <laughs> Does that make sense? It's not just that we're trusting in him because our trust is made complete, but it, I pray to God and. See, see, I've been praying, maybe it's about a marriage. I, I pray to God, God, please build it. Build it, God. But then my end is, a, is an apology. I'm going to apologize. Or maybe my end is simply showing Christ's love and Christ's service until the breakthrough. I'm, I'm going to pray to God and, and I'm going to do an and. Or, or maybe I've been praying about a financial thing. Lord, I just, I need my house to get in order. I need my house to get in order. Lord, make it in order. Make it in order. Make it in order. But maybe my and, simply a budget. I, I got to understand how much is coming in and how much I can actually spend. And I got to stick to that budget, get it in place. I need an and. And the reason this is so weighty for church people, I guess, is because, you know, in the church, it's so common to pray and to talk and to rally around Jesus, but then never always do. To pray, but then never and. See, last week was our Vision Sunday, and it was awesome. Our, our president did a ph phenomenal job. Setting the vision of what we could be doing together. And, and we're famous sometimes for, for hearing, but then never doing. So this is what I loved. I love that during the week I got an email that said, hey, you know what, I want to and. I don't want to just pray about the mission, but I want to and. And so I heard of people who want to get involved for the first time. And I saw new axes. And I've been hearing of all the ands that people are um, putting in their minds. You're going to hear after the service of an Oktoberfest, which is an and. And of a parade, which is an and. And we have people who's like, it's not just going to happen by itself. We're going to and. And I just thank you for that. How encouraging is the and. How encouraging when we not just depend on the Lord, but we and. That's awesome. And when this is going on, what could God do? Hmm. I love how the story ends. So verse 15, it says this, When the enemies heard that we were aware of their plot and that God had frustrated it, literally it said God had quashed it, we returned to the wall, each to our own work. And so how do we deal with opposition? We deal with it by letting God fight for us. We deal with it by seeing him win the victory. See, this is the God when the walls of Jericho were a threat. He just said, yeah, get down. This is the God when his people were fighting. He sent hail, turned armies against themselves, sent an angel, all done. This is the God when David needed strength against Goliath. It only needed a stone. This is the God who's by our side. Have you seen him work this way? I need to tell you about the good work and amazing love. We were looking for a permanent place to, to share the gospel. And, and, and I remember when we were praying anding. Praying anding, that's a new phrase. Uh, we were praying and we were pursuing land and zoning land. And some of you remember that. And, and, and then it was fraught with obstacles. We didn't know how it was going to get improved. But as we were praying anding, we met some wonderful people from Living Hope. And those wonderful people needed to sell a building and needed another church to come in. And as we prayed to God, he fought our battle while we were ending. And now we are here to the glory of God and the praise of his name. This is the God who can fight for you. 
He can help you win the battle of your mind. Over and against what people said, what Facebook said, and here's the worst one, over and against what you say to yourself, because that's always the nastiest. He can overcome them by saying, don't you know, you're the apple of my eye. Don't you know, you're my dearly beloved bride. Don't you know, you're my child. That's God who's bigger than we thought he was. Or maybe it's a financial struggle. We pray to God and, and then we see him come through, the provider of all things. He's bigger than we thought he was. Maybe it's a relationship with a spouse or a friend or a child, and we pray to God and we and, but then we see him restore people and restore relationships because he's that good. Maybe it's a physical circumstance. We pray to God and we get medical response, and then we see him fight those battles. That's the God who fought over Sanballat and Tobiah. The same God who's here by your side. May you see him fight for you. Now let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you are with us. I thank you that right now you're working out all good things for those who are called according to your purpose. Continue to bless our mission to reach the lost so that others can just be wowed by who you are and say, wow, you're bigger than what I previously thought. In Jesus' name, amen.